Wondery Plus subscribers can listen to Just Jack and Will early and ad-free. Find Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. Sean Patrick Hayes. Eric James McCormick. How's things, buddy? Things are really good. Things are really good. I, I, don't, have, I don't have anything to vent about today. Oh, that's very clever. <laughs> There's a lot of venting in today's Will and Grace episode. Yes, very good. Today we'll be going through episode 10, The Big Vent. Get it, everybody? And later on, we'll be talking to the great Glenda Ravella, production designer extraordinaire. Let's do this, because this is... Just Jack! And Will. Theme song! <laughs> It's just a theme song, uh, theme, theme song, song and there's some problems, it's just a theme song for you. I don't think this should be over the <laughs> fucking piano. And then there's theme song, theme song night. Hello, listeners. Welcome back to Just Jack and Will. It's a podcast where Sean Hayes and I break down an episode of Will and Grace every single Week before we get started, let's have yeah. a little chitty chat. So, oh, chitty chat. That's right. So, um, I always ask you the same thing every time I ask you because I don't know if listeners are sick of both of us talking about this yet. But no. we're both on Broadway. I know. I can't wait. Uh, Opening night is oh, is this Monday? I don't know when Monday. this episode airs yeah. that we're recording right now. But this episode, I'm so eh. Excited. Are you excited? Are you get nervous? I haven't had this exact experience before, which which is. Where it's a new play and previews have really mattered to us. And in your case, you guys started out of town. You did uh, yeah. weeks in Chicago. Yeah. Though our play's been done regionally a few places, uh, the playwright, um, uh, Sandy Rustin, has been in the room. Oh, We're wow. changing a lot of things, new jokes, new bits. They come and go. Um, and every night... If stuff works, if it doesn't work, we, we rehearse the next day, which I thought initially was going to be like, oh, man, I don't want to rehearse anymore. Let's just do it. But I've really liked the fact uh, that Jason Alexander, our director, is, is giving us lots of notes. We're changing. We're futzing. So I'm excited that what we'll present to you uh, on Monday is going to be pretty good. I'm so excited. So now, isn't this interesting that you say that? Because I found this with my play, doing live theater, doing a sitcom like Will and Grace is very similar to doing live theater. You get mm -hmm. to stop if you screw up on a, on a sitcom, not in real live theater. No, screwing up is, not, is less good. <laughs> yeah, it's less good. But isn't it interesting, when I was young on Will and Grace, I was taught this tool to use now that, to your point, where you get new lines or you're trying uh -huh. new things every That's night, right. mo a lot of actors, if you're not used to that, would scare them. And, but for me, I got a couple li new lines here and there throughout our previews mm -hmm. too. And I was like, great, it'll be fun. It's a little scary as you're coming up to the new line, as you're speaking. Oh my God, here comes my new line that I haven't tried yeah. yet. But it's kind of also exhilarating because we're used to getting new lines on the fly. We had one last night, Sean, that you will, you would have loved. <laughs> we have a prop in the show that is a statue of David, mm -hmm. Michelangelo's David. Period. Um, and then that's the thing yes. I would love. Exactly. No, what you'd love is that his dick is a cigarette lighter. So <laughs> Alex Moffat lights the two ladies' cigarettes. Is it a surprise? With, with the penis, yes. I'm, I'm, yeah. This is a spoiler alert. But I want everyone to come to see the show. for this. And then Alex puts the penis back in the statue because it comes out. He puts it back in and then lights his own cigarette and it looks like he's blowing blowing David. the statue <laughs> um but by the time last night by the time hysterical. alex by the time alex got to his cigarette the flame had gone out so he tried to pull it back out at this point the audience knows something oh wrong. no he tries to pull it back out it's it's very small and he's trying to light it again and i realize i'm sitting on the other side of the stage smoking a pipe which i have successfully lit and i grab one of my own matches considerably uh -huh. bigger than the penis and I light it and I walk across the stage and I say here you are brother and I go to light his cigarette and Lily Cooper says well I guess it's true size really does matter ah. and it was just such I a get. great improv the audience went bananas I love that I thought you were going to say so he was fun. trying to light it again it looked like he was giving him a hand job well <laughs> Either way, David got some action last night. Um, but uh, having a great, having a great time, and looking forward to all of our listeners getting their ass to New York City. And I seeing can't us wait both. the cottage. I can't wait. Um, great. Now it's time for just, just facts. facts. 
Just facts. Uh, this is episode 110, The Big Vent. Original air date was January 5th, 1999. Mm-hmm. Might as well be 1909. The episode was originally <laughs> supposed to air in December 98, but the show was preempted again for a movie this, this time. Remember, this used to happen like a I lot. Know. A movie. Oh. Like nowadays it would never happen because who? what network is showing a movie when you can watch movies and on what, any what, streaming service? You series? tell me, what is the conversation like behind closed doors? It's like, hey guys, we're not going to show, Let's instead of a new episode of Will and Grace, let's show while you were sleeping <laughs> the rom-com <laughs> with my friend Sandy Bullock, who I love, and yes. Bill Pullman. And by the way, auditioned for it. Uh, you auditioned for while you were sleeping? Yeah, because they filmed it in Chicago, so I auditioned uh, for it orderly at a hospital. That's amazing. Still waiting to hear. <laughs> Ratings, uh, 10.1 share, 15% of the audience for the night. Um, Give us the summary. Yes, this uh, this teleplay was written by Joni Marchinko, who we've mentioned many times, adore her. Very mm-hmm. funny woman. Uh, with a story by Tracy Poust and John Canali, who we have mm-hmm. recorded episodes with both of them. Yes. Um, love them. And by the way, Tracy uh, stopped by. She was in town for like 24 hours, and she came to check out the show. Oh, good. Uh, but this one is uh, the big vent. It's Will and Grace uh, b- uh, become preoccupied by the drama wafting up from their downstairs neighbors. Meanwhile, <laughs> me and Karen, Jack and Karen, produce my play, which is going to be a recurring theme. That Jack it is a recurring is, theme because I was just thinking yeah. about the, the James Earl Jones episode. I We've know, already done a lot the of just Jack episode. A lot of theater stuff. There's a. I want to talk about the guest cast when yes. we get to their scene. Okay, uh, great. Because they're both wonderful, and quite honestly, uh, and this is the fun of, of rewatching. I'd forgotten entirely about this plot. I just I, I just thought it was with the vent. I forgot yeah. how important your play is and how <laughs> funny it is. Oh, well, God, uh, I don't know about that. But um, on this day in 1999, January 5th, 1999, mm-hmm. Patch Adams, which I've been called a lot, and You've Got Mail, still at the top of the box office. And also um, uh, on that day, if you did, it was January 11th, John Stewart's first episode of The Daily Show. Oh, yeah. my God. I mean, wild. Yeah. I remember watching it before he he started. Craig Kilborn. Oh, my God. Craig Kilborn. I forgot about that. Yeah. Um, January 5th, 1999 is also the day that former pro wrestler Jesse the Body Ventura, remember him, took <laughs> office as a governor of Minnesota. I completely remember that. Yes, and then ushering you're like, in the new era of, of electing <laughs> wrestlers uh, into yes. office. Wonderful. And remember, like... Like Ronald Reagan, Sonny Bono, Jesse Ventura, yeah, Donald yeah. Trump, like all these people who are, you know, in the entertainment business. I know it's wild. Um, wild. Famous birthdays on January 5th. The great Robert Duvall. Love. The great Diane Keaton, love. my patron saint. Uh, Pamela Sue Martin, January Jones from Mad Men. Bradley mm-hmm. Cooper. Um, I, love who, Bradley. I don't know. You must know Bradley. I don't yeah, know. He's a very good but friend. I, I, adore, I adore his work. So sweet. Um, and George Reeves, who was the original Superman on TV in the yes. late 50s. <laughs> Did you ever watch reruns of that? Maybe it was too early for you. I, I know. I'd watch from the neck down, whoever it was. I just, I, <laughs> you you didn't want to see George Reeves from the neck down that much. Uh, later in season six of Will and Grace, Brandon Ruth, I think we've talked about Brandon before, he guest starred about two years before he played the role of Superman in Superman yeah. Returns. But I think it's Brandon Routh. Well, then uh, then you should just cut cut me. If you can cut me out of the podcast, it's going to be easier. Because <laughs> uh, I'll probably uh, no, say we, a bunch of things wrong. No. Do you remember when he sat with us at the Golden Globes? You tell me again. I can't remember. Okay, so so Brandon Routh comes up to the table and he's sitting at our table and I'm like, and he goes, "Hey, Sean." I go, "Hello." Um, I'm sorry. Uh, and then somebody said Brandon was on Will and Grace. I was like, "God, I'm such an idiot." Can you remind me of of which episode? And he's like, "Yeah, I was in uh, whatever one with with, with Hal uh, Linden, with Hal Linden, Barney Miller." Yeah. yeah. And and I was like, "Oh my God!" And uh, what are you doing now? And he goes. <laughs> I'm Superman. <laughs> I was not, like, what? Not I'm playing Superman. Yeah. I am. I'm Superman. And Superman. then I went on IMDb, and I don't know if there's one or two things in between, but it basically, Will and Grace, Superman. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was crazy. But anyway. Uh, so, guys, that's what was going on in 1999. When we come back, we'll be talking about plays and eavesdropping and stuff like that. Stick around. It's just Jack and Will. And Will. 
and will. <laughs> What do you think of my glasses? What do they say? They say, guys don't make passes at girls who wear glasses. And guys don't make passes at guys with fat asses. I think they make me look smart. Jack, it's the intellectual equivalent of stuffing a sock in your pants. Funny, 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 funny. <laughs> that was money. I, <laughs> I could never just let it go. <laughs> That's, uh, right? of course, a take on... Money, 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 Money by the OJs. Oh, how did you know that? It's a famous song from the 70s before you were born. Oh, they murdered that song. They murdered <laughs> Money, 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 hey. Money. Hey. The OJs. Yeah. Uh, all OJs. right, so the cold open. This is uh, Will and Grace's apartment. Uh, it's New York. It's winter. Everybody's cold. And... <laughs> I, I, and you guys come out of the uh, out of the bedrooms, and Grace has got and a seventy-five yeah. foot blanket around <laughs> with a seventy-five foot cord plugged in. It's an electric <laughs> blanket. Yes, I, I, I was I was watching that and thinking, we. I remember asking because I was that kind of pain in the ass actor. Because all of a sudden, they'd they the wardrobe would have a big coat, and I go, okay, so what? Because what month is it in Will and Grace? Because it wouldn't yeah. necessarily be the same. We'd shoot in August, a thing that would be airing in, in November. Right, right. And they'd be like, oh, this is going to be a winter episode. Of course, we were never outside, so we just had to go by things like this, where it's clearly freezing, freezing. in and New York City. So, and so hot, sweating my ass off in the sweater and the T-shirt and the, and the winter coat and the thing. Like, anytime we shot a, a you know, winter episode inside yeah. under the lights and take after take, you just started sweating profusely. <laughs> <laughs> so true. But, I, um, I, and I have the feeling this might have been the first one my parents saw. Oh, wow. Really? I could be wrong, but I just, I think that's why I remember it. I remember thinking about the vent storyline and they would, they think it was funny. And, and uh, it was around that time. That, that I would have flown them in for the first time, so. Oh, that's so sweet. I love that. I, and the sad part of of this is, you know, as we talk about too, too often, is that I don't remember any of these. This one, I really don't remember being there. I don't remember this story. I don't remember any of this. But the first thing I thought of when I was watching was like, I don't remember there being a vent in the floor. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Of course there wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> there was a vent in the floor for this episode. But I think, I guess the idea was there was supposed to be a carpet over it. But it's like, who puts mm -hmm. a carpet over a vent? I don't know. Yeah, and then I'm, I'm guessing it was gone after that. I don't know. Well, we'll have to ask that our part. special guest today, yes. Glenda Ravallo, who uh, designed all sets all the time for every episode ever. So she'll have an answer for that question. And of course, uh, the other thing I thought was like, well, if you can hear... If you can hear them, they can probably have always heard you. Um, so, uh, but why think of logic? <laughs> Grace is still listening to the vent. <laughs> you come home from work. Uh, she tries to hide it. Days of our vent was hysterical. Um, and I love that. I realized I have always been completely susceptible to, um, to suggestion. From, from television. If I see yeah. something, you know, back in the day, if I saw somebody smoking or drinking wine or whatever it is, it was like, oh, like watching The Godfather and needing pasta. But just me saying, or her saying shepherd's pie and me saying, yeah. okay, tell Julia Child, what's in a shepherd's pie? Uh -huh. I got really hungry for shepherd's pie. Yeah, I Why get it. That? Because like, the show's cozy Pavlovian. and comfy and yeah. so is the food you speak of. And then when she says shepherd's cheap, I don't know. And I say, sounds like a crock of sheep to me. I smiled because ah. I thought that's about the level that we could get away with on network television in 1999. It was a crock of sheep. <gasps> we know what it really means. It's a pun. It's, um, yeah. And then this joke made me laugh when he, she said, um, they're carrying on their affair. She's She keeps listening. And every day this week, except Wednesday. And then you say. <laughs> Which is ironically, hump day. It made me laugh out loud. Yes. Uh, and then the ooey thing is really funny because you know I think that's I think stuff like that is so so smart like it, it, as far as comedy goes it's like it's so uh, silly it's so like of course like I couldn't I couldn't make out his name so just, all I heard was 
ood, you know, <laughs> which is like true. Well, we'll find uh, out why, uh, why ood yes. in a couple of scenes. Then finally, some Jack. <laughs> I haven't had any Jack yet. Mm -hmm. uh, comes in with a great sort of with the glasses bit, the bit that we started uh, this section with. The uh, and why hopscotch? No idea. Uh, <laughs> coming in doing hopscotch, it's ridiculous. Makes no sense. Uh, shiny, shiny, do do something funny. Oh, huh? some hopscotch. Yeah, that's Jimmy Burroughs. <laughs> Uh, and then, yes, I'm writing a play, and then I want you guys to pay attention. Yeah, and, and again, uh, as we said earlier, kind of like we had just done the Just Jack thing. So yeah. the idea that of we're going, oh, you're writing a play? I was like, well, did, but you did. I mean, Just Jack was a thing that you wrote. Granted, it was more uh, like a cabaret. Like a cabaret, but still. Yeah. Um, and Lady you're, Bunny, how funny is Lady Bunny? Lady Bunny, for those who don't know, is a real hilarious, hysterical, talented drag queen. I had forgotten that. Yeah, yeah. Then we're on to Grace's office. Uh, I love when, you know, again, we talk about this. I don't know that you can get away with this on television now with Karen talking so horrible to Rosario. It's, I'm like, it's so race. It's we, we only, because it was always on the phone up until season two, pretty, pretty much the end of season one. Uh, right. I think the racism got, with her particularly was felt sort of latent and silly. It wasn't, but we'll see a little bit more something that feels racist with Karen later on in the episode. Yeah. Uh, and I love, she says, hola, when she hangs up. <laughs> hola. I was curious. I was wondering about the green eggs and I'm hammered joke. Yeah. Because obviously uh, a Dr. Seuss uh, reference. I was right. like, did, did the lawyers have to deal with that? Do they have to get permission? Do you just write a joke like that and, Green hope eggs and nobody yeah. from the Dr. Seuss uh, estate comes and says, you can't say that? I don't know. I know. I I didn't think about that too. You just said it, but I wonder if it falls under like that parody thing where like we're just making fun Probably. of Probably. Uh, I try to get her. I try to Jack again. Get her you get board. her to help produce. She produces many plays for you over the course of the next <laughs> 11 know. seasons. Um, although she said the, a classic Karen line. Honey, I don't produce theater. I am theater. And theater. <laughs> that was great. And I, by the way, how about the title of the play? How about the title of my <laughs> Love Among the Coconuts. <laughs> a, Car <laughs> a Caribbean fantasy. A Caribbean fantasy. I Ty mean... Love I Among the Coconuts. <laughs> So among the, by the way, I didn't get it until, at first. I was like, why is he writing a, like a, a Caribbean thing? Oh, coconuts. Mm. Love among the nuts. Testiculia. Oh. Um, and, and that lo lovely line you, you had that had, I think, about four rapid fire Just Jacks in it, <laughs> which was, again, a reminder of how quickly that became a, thing. a catchphrase. Yeah. You know? Wild. So crazy. Because it was episode four? that we first used it. Now this is episode 10. 10, yeah. Um, although confusing again, I just, because uh, I just watched the episode. It is episode 110 in when, when you find it now on television, but in Jim Colucci's book, it is not. It is later. So I think yeah. a, lot, a lot of these things got uh, aired out of a very different order than we shot them. And, and, for, your, and for the f folks listening, some, sometimes you'll hear me and Eric say 108, 109, 110. That doesn't mean 110. That <laughs> means season one, episode, season 10, one, episode 10, which nobody explained to me until like the eighth season of Will and Grace. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> We're back in Will and Grace's apartment. Um, there's some lovely uh, panning shots, which is uh, something mm -hmm. great that, that Jimmy always did. Um, mm -hmm. Is it this scene or the earlier one where we pan from that great little statue that you love? We open on it very tight. The the statue of the uh, of the oh. Chinese boy, boy oh. fish with a fish and yeah. uh, uh, the ba Chinese baby. It's it's a beautiful little thing that was always there. But we and now you know on what? It. When I watch Cheers, sometimes I don't know if you ever watch Cheers. Yeah. I'm like, oh, there's the classic Jimmy Burroughs pan. Because mm -hmm. Jimmy, again, just to remind listeners, Jimmy Burroughs, our director, directed every episode of Cheers and every, every episode of Will and Grace. I didn't think of that, that it's, some, it's something crucial on, on, on Cheers because the bar is so wide, such a wide set. And you've got to set the stage of how many people are there at that particular moment. Is it a quiet moment in the bar? It was less yeah. crucial on Will and Grace, but he still used it. And, and I think that's why that apartment... That we'll be talking about with with uh, Glenda. Um, yeah, mm -hmm. it looks so great. It always looks so great. It looks so big. People always talk about the size of it. Yeah, I, I love this. I come home. <laughs> I've got I've I've got the biggest stain on my shirt. 
I know. Uh, so I clearly took my jacket off somewhere, ate a taco apparently, and it all um, spilled on my on my shirt. Right. And I say never gesture emphatically with the taco in your hand. Grace is Oliver Wendell Holmes. I say Cesar Romero. I know it's so <laughs> freaking specific. This is like a joke that Stephen Weber would make. Um, which is why, which is a crazy, wasn't he Cesar Romero, the Joker? In exactly. The, he was the Joker yeah. on the original Batman. So we now have a sort of a, uh, we have, it's the birthday of the original Superman. And we've made a reference to the Joker <laughs> in the original television Batman. And, she, and there's that funny little bit where she said, I called in sick. I said, called who? You're the boss. Yeah. Said, I know. It was a strange conversation. <laughs> very funny. Very I thought funny that was really bit. funny, too. And that's, but what I loved is that I, I don't throw a shirt in with the laundry. I go down to the laundry room yeah. and yeah. launder ju just the shirt. Yeah. Which, uh, first of all, is insane. And second of all, I come back up in a tank top and, uh, and, and I, I looked okay. I don't look terrible in it. But... Um, but oh, also, you look are you kidding me? I was like, wow. Were you? Yes, I was. You, you could have had me anytime, Sean. You were just, you <laughs> know, you were slow. Now you, you tell slow. me. <laughs> uh, yeah. But I also come up with news that I've met Uwe, who is not Uwe. It's Judy, and we haven't been hearing it right. So now we're mm -hmm. both in. We are in. This made me laugh here because it turns out that she's sleeping with his brother. Yeah. Now, not to again spoil my play too much, but literally it's like a line from the play I'm doing. Right about, now? Yes, about sleeping with someone's... But a, no a, a way, woman really? sleeping with her husband's brother, yes. So, oh, my God. That, that made me... That, it's, it's, a, it's a perennial theme that comes up in comedy entertainment. I love that. <laughs> How about when Deb hit you that hard? It looked like it fucking killed. Like that was, we, we've all, we've all suffered the wrath of Deb's strength. Yeah. She, uh, <laughs> she really, she really doesn't know what she has. And when she decides to wallop you. It's, it's um, amazing. It's real. There were stitches. Uh, and then, okay. So then I enter, uh, being stood up by you guys and being stood up by you for the lady bunny show. Yeah. <laughs> and, I said, uh, I just spent I just spent three hours in the freezing cold outside a drag bar being harassed by a pair of Rosemary Clooney's, <laughs> which is really funny. Uh, um, which is funny, and and weirdly, in about three or four episodes, our guest star will be Miguel Ferrar. Rosemary Clooney is his mother. So it, that's uh, crazy. I by uh, the way didn't know that. Yeah. Wait um, a minute. Wait a minute. So Miguel Ferrar was. Mom was Rosemary Clooney. Who was Rosemary to George Clooney then? George uh, was Rosemary's, uh, is Rosemary's nephew. Uh, uh, Rosemary's brother was, was George's dad. Okay. Wait, so yeah. then Miguel and George So Miguel are... and George are cousins. I never, ever, ever knew that. Yeah. How about that? Yeah. This, uh, this scene ends with uh, a, a kind of a will insult to you, which is crucial because it will lead to everything that you, uh, that you write in your play. But I, what I thought was interesting, I say this line, it's something like, next week, next week you'll be, I don't know, studying to be a wet nurse and your script. Mm -hmm. will, and I said it exactly the way I say, it. five seasons later when J uh, Grace and I are having that big argument that sort of has become one of our favorite things, I, I say it the same way as I say, and you'll be like, I don't know. And it's it's literally the same phrasing. I thought, I really only have so many paintbrushes in my quiver. Sorry. Oh, no, come <laughs> as, on. As he, mixes, as he mixes metaphors all over the place. No, I just thought it was no. funny that there's a particular delivery that uh, absolutely gets echoed seasons later. Well, I think, we, I think we all have those where, like, the writers we're in love with certain, the musicality of certain lines True. for each yeah. of our characters. Yeah. And they would, they just be, they would be repeated. And, and but the audience would love it. Um, True enough. And uh, then, so we're finally at the Learning Annex. And, we're at the um, Learning Annex. And finally, the writers Jesus. have a chance to make fun of a sumo wrestler. Uh, I'm not sure why, <laughs> not sure why this was crucial. <laughs> I love finally. Finally. We got a finally, chance to it took 10 of. episodes. <laughs> But we make fun of the sumos. Um, right. 
Obviously, I mean, Jack Karen, was the, Jack was thinking of someone uh, a, a little bit more uh, fit. But boy, yeah. does Karen go to town on, on this guy? <laughs> I know, I poor can't. fella, uh, who, who isn't even uh, given a line. I know, and I love. I love to say in the end. In the end, uh, they had to go a different way because that character was coming off too, <laughs> too Jewish. Jewish. <laughs> uh, Very funny. Just Jack and and then um, uh, Karen spills the tea. She says, you're a terrible writer. You got to write what you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, at this point in the episode, I'm thinking, is that the end? Like, I, I absolutely could not remember where this goes. I just kept thinking, it's mostly about the vent. It's a vent. And mm -hmm. I forgot that this turning point of her telling you write about your pain that really yeah. the whole vent stuff and us being such assholes to you is the setup yeah. for the best part. Um, so we, we, won't, we go back to Will and Grace one more time and now we're going to settle in with ice cream and listen to the big mm -hmm. thing. Then we remember we have to go and see your play. And of course, at this moment, yeah. I'm thinking, wait a minute, there is no play. She, he threw the play out. Oh, right. He's going to write a new play. And I had no memory of what it is. Yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm telling you, I, did, I really watched it for the first time. I was like, oh, I'm so excited to see what this play is about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no clue. Anyway, we walk into the classroom. I love that I had a, have a Welcome Back Cotter reference. I love that, <laughs> Mr. Cotter. Yeah. Uh, which really made me laugh. Um, There's one joke that you had that was so thrown away, and I thought it was so funny when... When in the previous, uh, before we get oh, to yeah. the actual thing, Grace remembers that you, that you guys have to go to the play mm -hmm. and you go, oh, that's right. He's a writer this week, <laughs> 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 which yeah. I think is hysterical, but it got so, it was so under the radar. But that's when I saw that one, I went, that's where I was headed. Eventually I, w I would learn by the end of the first season that the fun, the funnier stuff was the one, the ones you throw away, not yeah. the ones I hit over the head with a mallet. So <laughs> nice I, to meet you. Nice. To <laughs> 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 yeah. But that's what Jack did. Okay. So wait, go back. So go back to the learning annex. So we're the learning annex and you had that very, I loved the, the what is the title? Of the, the new play? <laughs> yeah. Untitled Jack McFarland Fall Project, entitled Jack and Meditation in Three Parts. <laughs> and I say, I guess there's something about Mary was already something taken. taken. Brilliant. Which is a great joke. I love that. And then yeah. Yeah. two actors come on stage playing Will and Grace. <laughs> and I thought, yeah. oh my God, this, I forgot how good this was as a, as a revenge fantasy for Jack. Yeah. To be able to write, he writes his own death because he got hit by a bus. And just <laughs> all he wants to do is write about how uh, upset we are, which I how think is you are. Right. And then <laughs> hilarious. And then you and both the characters take their own lives at the end. <laughs> but we have to talk about this. So, so the casting, uh, we've talked, yes. about, I think, a little bit about Tracy Lillianfeld, our, um, our casting director, who not yes. only gave us the jobs of our, our, our lifetimes, um, but occasionally cast so beautiful, always cast well, but I mean, some parts you just go, oh man, she just mm -hmm. did this right. I thought she nailed it with these two actors. Yes, I mean, for sure. you, could, you could close your eyes and think it was Deborah and I. Yeah. Um, so a Jen, a Jensen Daggett, uh, with her great curly blonde hair, I mean, really looks like a blonde messing. Yeah. Uh, and sounds a bit like her. Yeah. Um, but, and I'm looking at the actor playing Will. And it, mm -hmm. his name is Robert Curtis Brown. Yeah, amazing. And he was so good. And I thought, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know this guy. And it, I had to go and look it up because I'm elderly. But Robert <laughs> played on, on a show I did for three years called Perception. Yeah. Uh, oh, Robert, really? Yeah, he was Robert, on Perception? He played my, my character has schizophrenia in, in the show and my character's therapist is a really important character for about four episodes. And in the end, it turns out my therapist did something really horrible. Like he's a, he's, he's the murderer basically. Mm -hmm. And it was Robert Curtis Brown. And we had some great scenes. We had this one particular scene that took place in his office and he was playing one of those therapists uh, with the low voice and total control. And uh, I was very much under his spell. And we had about an eight page and for television this is huge an eight page scene 
Just wow. me sitting in my chair, him sitting in his chair, where slowly but surely it turns from him helping me to me revealing that I know exactly what he's done and he's under arrest. And it was so, it was, I remember it being wow so great, but it's not a scene I've seen since we did it in probably 2013. But Robert Curtis Brown, if you're out there listening, and Jensen, for that matter, you're both uh, great in this scene, and it was nice to see your faces. Did you did you talk to him about... <laughs> Here's me. We Did you talk have. about Will and Grace? We must have. I just, yeah. you know, totally forgotten. I'm sure he came up and he said, you don't remember, but I did Will and Grace. Because it would have been, wow, it would have been 12 years, 13 years uh, later that he did. Um, That's wild. Perception. Also interesting to note that the, the, the voice, the male voice from the vent is it, performed yep. by Barry Hines, who is the husband of casting director Tracy Lillianfield <laughs> and also the father... Of my friend Ben Hines, who works for my production company, Hazy Mills Productions. Crazy. Which is um, crazy. But anyway, the, the play itself, the two, the two actors as us, our comments as we realize <laughs> what you've done. Um, yeah. And then, of course, Karen coming in as the idea that Karen would guard the pearly gates. Yeah. Be freaking funny. <laughs> that is uh, funny. And then yeah, you basically and, have us kill ourselves, Romeo and Juliet style. I <laughs> mean, have us take poison. <laughs> I mean, I was and laughing curtain. really hard. And, and then curtain. it's like, <laughs> yeah, cut, print, Tony. I mean, curtain. And all because I was upset you didn't uh, pay attention to my play or read my script. Yeah, blah, blah, blah. You were uh, angry enough that you would finish your play with "Enjoy your journey to hell." Yeah. <laughs> <sighs> Um, and then we wrap that up with with uh, payback is uh, I get to have one of your suit jackets. <laughs> yeah, or several. <laughs> or several, okay. yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and the, But we wrap up the whole Will and Grace episode. Uh, with the thing, which what you said earlier, if, if, yeah. if we can hear them, can't they hear us? Well, mm -hmm. it turns out they can. Yes. And uh, the idea that what they're hearing is that clearly Grace is married to a gay man is pretty funny. Yeah, that is funny. Hopefully, Tom. How, what are their characters' names? Thomas and Judy. Judy hopefully yeah. they. Hopefully they work things out. Uh, guys, that was episode one ten, the big vent. And when we come back, we will have our fabulous production designer Glenda Ravella to talk about her iconic sets for the show. I can't wait to see her. I haven't seen her forever. See you in a second. It's just Jack and Will. Guys, we are so excited to have our production designer, Glenda Ravello, talk about all of the sets and how she did this on Will & Grace all of those years. I love her. I haven't seen her in forever. We haven't seen her in forever. I can't wait to catch up with her. Ladies and gentlemen, it's Glenda Ravello. Glenda! Yay! Hi, fellas. How are you, honey? I'm good. I'm good. I'm so happy to see you both. Probably not busy now, but you have been so busy up until now. You have never stopped. Yes, I've been very lucky. I've had a great career. Yeah, it's incredible because you're great. First of all, let's get the good stuff out of the way. You look exactly <laughs> the same. <laughs> you don't age at all. And you know what? Um, I can say the, the same about you guys. And I've been this watching. Is correct. Like, That's why yeah, I said it. Yeah, I watched the, the big vent like three times. Oh, really? You, yeah. yeah. Now, is, it, is it crazy to go back for you? Or, I mean, do you ever? You probably. I do. I, mean, I do. Um, you know, like there's always a time that um, either like my kids have something on. I go, oh, I worked on that or, right. or you know, that kind of thing. And um, it's just remarkable that. You know, the big vent was 24 years ago. Yeah, isn't that amazing? Nuts. It is. It really yeah. is. It's nuts. Describe people what a production designer does exactly and how it's different. Because when I was younger, I was like, wait, does she pick out the pillows and, and all the, 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 the couch? No, Sean, she doesn't. She designs. She's the production designer. Everything you she see. Designs. Yeah, everything you see. Well, um, it starts with the script. I read it. And then I try to imagine how these things will take place. So, you know, like on the big vent, you know, I didn't have a whole lot to do other than selecting an event and then Jimmy would place <laughs> it. 
But in a normal, you know, on a normal episode, um, I'd read the script, imagine what the restaurant would look like or the apartment or whatever the swing set is. And then I would collect images and I would share that with um, the executive producers, our writers and the director. Like, like, like images, like an idea board. Yeah, or called, yeah, like I did them board. every single episode. And then and that would um, I would also have a plan as well, like, you know, you know, where the entrances are, that's what Mm -hmm. Jimmy was primarily concerned with is, you know, Mm -hmm. how does he take people across the set? And then I would have meetings with um, the decorator and then Mm -hmm. he or she would go out and select things that kind of were, would support the images I had already had approved. Got it. When you were first hired by, uh, by Max and David, um, what was the discussion that you had with them in terms of how much freedom were you given to create an authentic and and fresh look at a New York apartment on television? Mm-hmm. Wow, that is really a great question. Um, Thank you. And the reason... Um, <laughs> I just because, texted it to him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's a couple of things I need to um, mention that um, the first year I was the assistant art director. And um, so I did go to some of the initial meetings with Max and Dave and Bruce Ryan. And but Bruce was super busy. And so um, Bruce really gave me like a tremendous amount of freedom and with that and Max and David's support, um, we came up with this apartment. And for a lot of it, um, it was, a you know, we did kind of suspend belief in terms of the scale of the apartment, the finishes, because it was such a beautiful apartment. And that's really what they wanted. It was idealized. Mm-hmm. And we knew that from the get go, it wasn't supposed to be, you know, a struggling lawyer in any way. Mm-hmm. You know, we mm-hmm. wanted this universe of, you know, high design. And, and a lot of that is goes directly to the Will character that he just mm-hmm. has such beautiful taste. And Could you it, imagine? Imagine if they came to you yeah. with like, so he's a struggling lawyer. We want it to be a <laughs> studio apartment. Uh, we want it to look really. <laughs> That's <laughs> every really other every other pilot. <laughs> you know, yeah. yeah, it can be <laughs> aspirational true. but realistic. Yeah, I mean, the character of Will is so reflective of Max Muchnick, uh, mm-hmm. and not just that he's a, a, a gay man with aspirations uh, professionally, but that he has a tremendous taste. Absolutely. And I always thought that Max is. Uh, opinion. I, I have to say apologies to Bruce Ryan. I don't remember that it wasn't just you from the beginning in charge. Yeah, I, really, I don't either. Well, I was amazing. always the person on the ground. And so yeah. when mm-hmm. it got to the second season, um, Max, David and Jimmy, it was like unheard of. You know, I, I leapfrog from assistant art director to production designer. And, um, you know, wow. so... I didn't know what a gift that would be, but they were really my champions. And the uh, we were doing so well that the network, you know, would, you know, say yes to anything. I think that they asked for. So I was lucky us beyond lucky. I was the lucky one. Wow, that's. Do you remember the decision? Because so many of the sets in the first season uh, set such a tone. Do you remember? uh, We'll talk about Grace's office in a second. I'm curious about the decision to put uh, Will's office in clearly a basement. A part. I, I love that. I, I love so that. I love it too. I, I love that. Too. Eric had mentioned just he loved it, but it made, made him feel so claustrophobic sometimes. But I loved it. Because I, I believed cozy. it. When yeah. we were on that set, with when the feet would walk by uh-huh. and the window up, I'd go, oh, it's really a basement apartment. Which <laughs> well, lived it was in a garden times. apartment, you know, like, um, you know, so, they're, yeah. they're everywhere. You know, every brownstone has that lower level or townhouse. And so, um, and we were just trying to find like, you know, something unusual and that could become iconic. And also, um, I wanted to give you a lot of windows, but there's something about like the New York skyline that um, they weren't just the best options for backings. And mm-hmm. I and we weren't creating them yet then. We were just renting them. Um, this was, you know, That's before right. we could just, you know, have things made. Maybe by the third season, I could do whatever I wanted. But then I was still yeah. renting. So um, Such a huge part of, uh, again, particularly sitcoms, because we're sort of stuck in one set 
we're not going in and out of doors. That those, uh, would you call backings? I mean, just the when you think, uh, when you, the audience, think that we're in an apartment and we can see the skyline, or it's those things are expensive. They're yeah, very somebody expensive. Somebody told me they're the most expensive thing on the set. Is that true? Yes, and they're fragile, and you know, yeah. I don't know how many we damaged or got, you know, melted by a lamp or whatever or walked. Is it through. just a blown up photograph? Or it is. It's just a yeah. blown up photographs, and now they they have more technique to them. Um, back mm-hmm. then, or and they were also painted. We had painted backings as well, hmm. um, but uh, wow. yeah, yeah. What but a skill that is. yeah, but yours. I just wanted to do something different, and, and instead of just putting a bush, you know, which you don't see often in a high rise, um, you can't see that. So I wanted to just get some other mid ground, and I thought, oh, let's get people's legs going by. Glenda, talk about the inspiration for for Grace's office, like yeah. where. How did you come up with that? And Max, and- um, you know, when I showed him images of like designers, I always start with precedent. Um, so um, in New York, I would show them like different designers, you know, whether it was like, um, I don't know, like a big corporate firm or, um, you know, a, a quirkier small firms. Uh, Max would always gravitate to like a little bit of an industrial look. And he already knew he wanted to use the puck building. So that kind of told me that it was brick. And then um, he likes he likes that industrial look. And I love mm-hmm. the idea mm-hmm. of, of um, giving them an elevator, the the. Um, the service elevator because yeah, she's a yeah, decorator cool. and she so, might be bringing so up a chair looking. and yeah. Um, and so that was the inspiration is, you know, like just a, a woman in an industrial space, what would that look like? You know, I don't want to bore you with money, but just how many yards of fabric and every year we just stepped up the, the quality. Wow. And, and well, you know, actually I was about to ask about money because I mean, it, our show is one of those shows that you can see over time, particularly in the women's wardrobe, how much money we got to make the show look great. You, some of your sets were yeah, gorgeous. Incredible. It was, I got lazy. I, I would always, I would read every script going, I hope it all takes place in my apartment because I just like being there. But yeah. inevitably there'd be something, a courtroom or a bar mm-hmm. or this. And that was always amazing every week to walk in and go, how did, where did, how did this happen it, so it, fast? It's so not normal. It was so not normal. Um, I, you know, God bless Tim Kaiser for finding that money. Um, but we didn't always go to prop houses. I, you know, I'm a fan of wallpaper. And, um, <laughs> and it's for all, almost all of it was from Europe you know, at least in our first go around and, um, and just getting it here in time. And Max would really, yeah, Max would give me a heads up, like in three episodes, I want the most amazing, you know, restaurant or whatever. And, um, you know, we kind of had, it wasn't carte blanche, but we had, we, we had a lot of support. So, um, and, and a lot of it came from stores, you know, from, boutiques and galleries and, and, um, and, you know, we would rent from, not from prop, ha- prop houses because it was so much fresher. Amazing. But now let's get to the big vent because I want to know, so obviously the vent was built just for this episode and I'm assuming Jimmy wanted you to build it where you did because it was easily shot there. It was right Absolutely. in the middle of the set, yeah. right? Right, right <laughs> and, in the middle um, of the set. And when you right say the build... <laughs> When you yeah, say yeah, build, yeah. you just, know that sorry. was just me jumping just, into my Prius and going yeah. to a Home Depot. I go, oh, that one's brass. That looks yeah. big. You know, so <laughs> and that, then you put it on the floor. And, yeah, and we we put I put a piece of black paper underneath it and put it on the floor with some double stick tape. You know, that's it was so, really that's sophisticated. So wild. <laughs> what was what was your favorite set you ever you ever did? Um, I have to say that I really loved the um the one where we go back to the turn of the you know 20th century you know when yes, you, yeah that's where I you know was all going, those yeah. uh, you know those oh, uh, those, those historical ones the uh, tenement um, the tenement you mean museum like the, the Christmas episode we did in the, in the reboot <sighs> yeah, is that the I one just, you meant yeah I love I, those oh, sets. I remember that uh, I remember yeah. this, it, Will, it was the, basically the Will and Grace apartment in 1900 mm-hmm. uh, and that particular set. Uh, I just remember I was jaw, my jaw dropped. It was so great. I, I love that. And all that wallpaper was all custom printed for our show by these old hippies in Benicia. And um, <laughs> they're unbelievable. Wow. Yeah, they're really great. That and then um, what? Oh, Karen's Kitchen. Yeah, that was yeah. very fancy. There are so many good ones. I mean, you've got to make that look 
is mm-hmm. exactly expensive. as expensive as it's supposed yeah. to be. Yeah. And, you know, there was a running joke um, in the writer's room is that her her mansion was a, the mansion of a thousand rooms. They deliberately yeah. wanted us to go to different rooms every time we went to Karen's house. So we would build those really extraordinary yeah. um, sets, and we'd see it one time. Um, like the, I think we went to the foyer, her foyer a few times, but yeah, you know, like whether yeah. it was her library or the hallway outside the the uh, nursery or the conservatory, her kitchen. I remember, but yeah. it was like I remember her going bathroom. on stage and walking out and going, "Oh my God, this is Karen's ba- bedroom. This is Karen's bathroom. Yeah. Wow, this is Karen's foyer. Like it was Christmas. It was like, oh, this is you know, it was wild to see what came out of your head and realized and in, in life, it was cool." Well, it was Christmas for me, too, because I would say, you know, like, I I absolutely loved building in the mill, and then it would move to stage, and then the morning set dressing came in. Man, that was unbelievable to see them, you know, that added so much life to them. Mm -hmm. I loved it. Yeah. And for people listening, the, the... The speed at which this happened, I don't know how long, how many weeks you had prior to to uh, designing, because you were designing like an architect, designing these sets. But we would shoot a show one night, and let's say the other sets were a bar and a, and a police station or something. We'd have one day where we'd read the next script, and, and it wouldn't be on stage. When we come back two days later on the Thursday, you guys had already erected the, the new sets. Most of them were... Like you could rehearse on them. They were not. Oh, they, we it, had to incredible. rehearse on them. We had yeah. to because um, Jimmy had to walk through them. So, yeah. And, they, and those crew they, guys would work all at, at like through the night. Uh-huh. Is that like true? you guys would finish maybe shooting around 10 ish. Maybe. Is that, you know, ten. like on a, yep. a good night. Um, and so um, construction and the grips would come in at 1206 a.m. No so way. Um, that's when they would come in and the uh, the sets that were going to be struck, you know, come out, those yeah. would come out. And then we would already have um, like the, the low boy, the trailers full of the new walls there. And then um, I think by 6 a.m., the uh, set dressing trucks would be unloaded. So that's at 6 a.m. So, so they would work from, from midnight to 6 a.m.? 12.06 to 6 a.m. and the flooring had to go in. So they they had a 4 a.m. call. Oh my God. Yeah, so. I mean, I knew Incredible. I knew that, but I just didn't absorb it. Yeah, yeah it always it's seemed fun. like magic. And Because uh, it kind of is, it's a lot of work that, you know, made that magic, but you know, but it's well choreographed. So, yeah, you know, all yeah. the departments know what to do. It's just fascinating. Yeah. Um, so Glenda, well, listen, I, we would love for you to come back and talk about some of your favorite stuff too. Um, if you're, if you're open and willing, because we'd love it. Sure. Of course. Of course. And you know, like I did say, you know, like for, uh, you know, the show that is 25 years old, um, (laughs) it looks so damn good. You guys look good. The, the, the costumes look amazing. You know, they're not, there's nothing embarrassing. You know, so, yeah. so it's it, so true. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I agree. It's, it's nice to feel proud of something that you did mm-hmm. when you were so much younger. Uh, you're amazing. We love you. Thank you for being here. And we're going to call on you again. Bye you guys. Bye, Bye honey. Glenda. Thank you. <laughs> uh, that was a blast. Uh, I, I love Glenda. I mean, just uh, I she's just a force that a quiet force. Like the the sets on the show were designed yeah. before we would start rehearsing on them. So the, she was doing her genius work often before we got to see her talk to her a lot of the time. I know. And I, as, as a young and coming in, I was like, how does all this get put together? And it was yeah. her. It was yeah. just unbelievable. Um, but uh, before we go, guys, let's see what the listeners want to know about. This one is from someone named Stacy. Let's hear what Stacy has to ask. Stacy says, my question for both of you is, if you could go back in time and play any character on another TV show or movie, another one, who would that be and why? Thank yes. you so much. Love you both. Ooh, <sighs> you want to go first? These kind of questions are tough because the ones that I loved... I loved because I loved the the way That's, the person played it, right? Exactly right. Exactly right. Yeah. So it's hard to think of a role where I thought I could do better than that. Well, when um, I was 11, I really wanted to be Henry Thomas. That's when I knew I wanted to be an actor, Henry Thomas and E.T. And um, so oh, sure. my, answer, my answer would be anything Steven Spielberg made during the golden age of, you know, feature films. Or 
again, to your point, Eric, these people did phenomenal, but like I would have loved to have played Mozart as Salieri oh. in the uh, in the movie, yep. I guess. Any Philip uh, Seymour Hoffman role or the Carol Burnett show or Basil Fawlty and Faulty Towers. <laughs> okay, wait, oops, wait, wait till you see that, how much of Basil Fawlty I've stolen. Oh, really? Uh, I can't wait. Play. It's 100% uh, John Cleese all the time. Um, I, yeah, I, the number of things I covet, I think it's more that I covet, like I covet what uh, Kevin Klein did in A Fish Called Wanda. Oh my Wanda. God, yes, yes. You know what I mean? Um, I covet, like I, I, I went through a period when we first started the show, um, Messing had done at least one, if not two, Woody Allen movies, which is not fashionable anymore. But back then it was a yes. thing to be desired and, and he was a big influence on me. And I remember seeing John Cusack in Bullets Over Broadway, which was the closest thing to a, a not Jewish guy basically playing Woody Allen. Yes. And I, and I just thought, Eric, I, I just want that. I just want to be that. Uh, it's a it's a great movie. Kuzak I just is great watched it, it for the first yeah. time last week. Oh, you're kidding. Do you know where they filmed it? I don't. At the I mean, Belasco you, Theater. Oh, you're kidding. At your theater. S swear to God. That's, is that why you just, watched it? Because somebody said you got to see the Belasco. So, in the, no, in the somebody, I'm, I'm Emily Burgle, who plays my wife in, in Good Night Oscar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I just watched Bel Belasco for Broadway. And I was like, you know, I've never seen that. And then she revealed that it was shot there. I was like, I got to see this. I've never seen it. It was fantastic. It's such a great film. Uh, but that's a role that I went, oh, I'm, you would have been perfect. I would have. By the way, there's still, do you, there's still, there could still be, there aren't enough films about theater. That is so true. <laughs> um, let's make one. Let's make one, shall we? Let's make one. Guys, if you want to send a question and email us at justjackandwill at gmail.com, or you can leave us a voicemail at 818-308-4012. Again, 818-308-4012. We like voicemails. We love to hear where you're from and what you're thinking. And yeah. we'll play it on the radio. <laughs> on the <laughs> I love radio. On the radio. <laughs> uh, next That's week's hysterical. episode is, is, uh, is uh, episode 111. I do remember this one very well. Will on Ice. Um, this was Will's birthday. I remember that. Oh. And, yeah. I can't, and, can't wait uh, to see it. That's about all I remember. But uh, we're going to have a special guest to discuss it, the writer of the episode, but also the director, writer, and producer of Sex and the City, and just like that, creator of The Comeback and Two Broke Girls. Yes, we'll be talking to our friend Michael Patrick King. Oh my so God. you will not want to miss that. So until next time, cut, print. Tony! I mean, curtain. Bye. Just Jack and Will is produced by Smartless Media. Produced, engineered, and edited by Devin Tory Bryant. That's me. Our talent producer is Ann Harris. Our associate producer is Maddie McCann. Invaluable assistance by Michelle Laparo and Nick Dote. Music by Scott Eisnogel, Lior Rosner, and Raina Larson. Although the Just Jack and Will sting is my fault. Executive producers are Will Arnett, Jason Bateman, and Sean Hayes. Executive producers for Smartless Media are Richard Corson and Bernie Kaminsky. Meet you back here next week for more Just Jack and Will. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to Just Jack and Will early and ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen early and ad-free with Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey.